Section fifty nine of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty six, part two. But Wagner hears her not. She stamps her foot with impatient rage upon the sand, and in another moment the groves conceal her lover from view. Yes, Wagner looked not round, heard not the voice of Nisida invoking him to return, but continued his rapid flight toward the mountains as if hurrying in anguish and in horror from the meshes which had been spread to ensnare his mortal soul and now nisida became all selfishness there was at length a hope a sudden hope that she should be speedily enabled to quit the hated monotonous island and her fine large dark eyes were fixed intently upon the white sails which gradually grew more and more palpable in the azure horizon she was not deceived there was no doubt no uncertainty as to the nature of the object which now engrossed all her thoughts and filled her heart with the wildest joy it was indeed a ship and its course was toward the island for as she gazed with fixed and longing eyes it by degrees assumed a more defined shape and that which had at first appeared to be but one small white piece of canvas gradually developed the outlines of many sails and showed the tapering spars until at last the black hull appeared completing the form of a large and noble vessel joy joy she should yet be saved from the island and ah do the chances of that hope for safety multiply is it indeed another ship which has caught her eye in the far-off horizon yes and not one only but another and another and another until she can count seven vessels all emerging from the mighty distance and spreading their snow-white canvas to the breeze which wafts them toward the isle crowds of conflicting thoughts now rush to the mind of nisida and she seats herself upon the strand to deliberate as calmly as she may upon the course which she should adopt alas ferdinand thou wast not then uppermost in the imagination of thy nisida although she has not entirely forgotten thee but the principal topic of her meditations the grand question which demanded the most serious weighing and balancing in her mind was whether she should again simulate the deafness and dumbness which she had now for many months been accustomed to affect grave and important interests and a deeply rooted attachment to her brother on the one side urged the necessity of so doing but on the other a fearful disinclination to resume that awful duplicity that dreadful self-sacrifice an apprehension lest the enjoyment of the faculties of hearing and speech for so long a period should have unfitted her for the successful revival and efficient maintenance of the deceit these were the arguments on the negative side but Nisida's was not a mind to shrink from any peril or revolt from any sacrifice which her interests or her aims might urge her to encounter and it was with fire flashing eyes and a neck proudly arching that she raised her head in a determined manner exclaiming aloud yes it must be so but the period of this renewed self-martyrdom will not last long so soon as thine interest shall have been duly cared for francisco i will quit florence for ever i will return to this island and here i will pass the remainder of my days with thee my beloved ferdinand and that i do love thee still ferdinand although thou hast fled from my presence as if i were suddenly transformed into a loathsome monster that i must ever continue to love thee ferdinand and that i shall anxiously long to return to thine arms are truths as firmly based as the foundations of the island thine then shall be the last name thy name shall be the last word that i will suffer my lips to pronounce ere i once more place a seal upon them yes i love thee ferdinand oh would to god that thou couldst hear me proclaim how much i love thee my beauteous my strangely fainted ferdinand it was almost in a despairing tone that nisida gave utterance to these last words for as the chance of escape from the island grew every moment less equivocal by the nearer approach of the fleet which was however still far from the shore the intensity of her sensual passion for wagner that passion which she believed to be the purest and most firmly rooted love revived and her heart smote her for her readiness to abandon him to the solitude of that island but as she was now acquainted with all the mysteries of his fate as she knew that he could not die for many many years to come nor lose that glorious beauty which had proved alike her pleasure and her pride her remorse and her alarms were to a considerable degree mitigated for she thought within herself although she now spoke aloud no more death will not snatch him from me disease will not impair his godlike features and an elegant form and he loves me too well not to receive me with open arms when i shall be enabled to return to him these were her thoughts and starting upon her feet she compressed her lips tightly as if to remind herself that she had once more placed a seal there 
a seal not to be broken for some time an hour had now passed since fernand wagner and nisida separated on the seashore and he did not come back meantime the fleet of ships had drawn nearer and though she more than once entertained the idea of hastening after wagner to implore him to accompany her whithersoever those vessels were bound or at least depart with the embrace of tenderness yet her fear lest the ships might sail past without touching the island predominated over her softer feelings and now having settled in her mind the course she was to adopt she hastened to the stores which she had saved from the wreck of the corsair vessel and which had been piled up on the strand the day after she was first thrown on that mediterranean isle it will be remembered that amongst the articles thus saved were changes of apparel which stefano verina had procured for her youth at leghorn ere the corsair bark set sail on that voyage from which she had never returned and during nisida's long sojourn on the island she had frequently examined those garments and had been careful to secure them from the effects of rain or damp in the hope that the day would sooner or later come when she might assume them for the purpose of bidding adieu to that lovely but monotonous island and now that day has come and the moment so anxiously longed for appeared to be rapidly approaching nisida accordingly commenced her toilet as if she had only just risen from her couch and was preparing to dress to go abroad amongst the busy haunts of human beings her dark luxuriant hair which so long had floated negligently upon her ivory shoulders was gathered up in broad massive bands at the sides and artistically plaited and confined at the back of her well-shaped head the tight bodice was next laced over the swelling bosom hose and light boots imprisoned the limbs which had so often borne her glancing along in their nudity to the soft music of the stream in the vale or of the wavelets of the sea broidery set off the fine form of nisida in all the advantage of its glowing full and voluptuous proportions then the large black veil was fastened to the plaits of her hair whence its ample folds swept over that admirable symmetry of person endowing her once more with a queen-like air which became so well her splendid yet haughty style of beauty yes no longer subdued by simplicity of attire no longer tender and soft was the loveliness of nisida but grand imperious and dazzling did she now seem again as erst she seemed ere her foot trod that island shore apparelled in handsome garments and with the rich carnation glow of health and animation in her cheeks and with her eyes flashing the fires of hope but with the vermilion lips compressed nisida now stood on the strand where so oft she had wandered like a naird feeling no shame at her semi-nudity during the time occupied by her toilet the fleet of seven ships had approached much nearer to the island and now they were not more than three miles distant the hulls which at first had seemed quite black shone as they drew closer with the gay colours in which they were painted the gorgeous sunlight playing vividly on the gilding of the prows streaks of red and white along the sides and the splendid decorations of the poop lanterns noble and mighty ships they were ships of size such as nisida had never seen before and in comparison with which all the merchant vessels she had beheld at leghorn were but mere boats there was no need to raise a signal to invite them to approach for that fleet was evidently steering toward the island whence did this fleet come whither was it bound to what nation did it belong and would those on board treat her with attention and respect such were the thoughts which flashed across her brain and her heart beat with anxiety for the arrival of the moment which should solve these questions absorbed as she was in the contemplation of the noble ships those mighty but graceful swans of the ocean she did not forget to cast from time to time a rapid glance around to see if ferdinand were retracing his way toward her alas no he came not and she must quit the isle without embracing him without assuring him of her constant love without renewing her oft-repeated promise to return ah a thought struck her she would leave a note for him in the hut no sooner was the project determined on than she set about its execution for there were writing materials amidst the stores saved from the corsair wreck a brief but tender letter was hastily penned and then secured in a place where she knew he must find it should he revisit the rude tenement in which they had so often slept in each other's arms and that he would revisit it she both fondly hoped and firmly believed revisit it so soon as the excitement and the terror under the influence of which he had parted from her should have subsided her mind was now much easier and her beauty was wonderfully enhanced by the glow of animation which suffused itself over her countenance giving additional light to her ever brilliant eyes and rendering her noble aquiline face resplendent to gaze upon the ships came to anchor at a distance of about two miles from the shore and though the banners of each were fluttering in the breeze 
yet nisida was not well skilled enough in discriminating the flags of different nations to be able immediately to satisfy herself to which country that fleet belonged but as she stood with her eyes fixed on the foremost vessel which was also the largest she noticed that there was a gilt crescent in the middle of the blood-red standard that floated over her central poop lantern and a chill struck to her heart for the thought of african pirates flashed to her mind this alarm was however as effervescent as it was poignant for another moment's reflection convinced her that none of the princes of africa could send so proud a fleet to sea following up the chain of reasoning thus suggested and calling to her aid all the accounts she had read of naval fights between the christians and the moslems she at length remembered that the blood-red banner and the gilt crescent in the middle denoted the presence of the capitan pasha or lord high admiral of the ottoman empire confidently believing that peace existed between italy and turkey she had now no longer any fears as to the treatment she was likely to experience at the hands of the mohammedans and it was with unfeigned joy that she beheld a boat which had put off from the admiral's ship at length approaching the shore as the magnificently painted and gorgeously gilt barge which twenty-four white turbaned rowers urged along with almost horse race speed near the strand nisida observed beneath the velvet canopy in the stern a personage whom by his splendid apparel his commanding demeanour and the respect paid to him by the slayers accompanying him was evidently of exalted rank she accordingly conceived that this must be the capitan pasha himself but she was mistaken her delight at the approach of the barge which she fondly hoped would prove the means of her deliverance from the island was only equalled by the surprise of those on board at beholding a beautiful and elegantly dressed lady unattended and alone on the seashore as if awaiting their arrival and during the few minutes which now elapsed ere the barge touched the strand it was evident that the high functionary seated beneath the canopy surveyed nisida with increasing wonder and admiration while she on her side could not help noticing that he was remarkably handsome very young and possessing a countenance rather of an italian than a turkish cast of features meantime a profound silence broken only by the slight and uniform sounds produced by the oars prevailed and when the boat touched the strand a long and wide plank covered with velvet was so placed as to enable the high functionary before alluded to to land conveniently attended by two slaves who followed at a respectful distance the moslem man chief advanced toward nisida whom he saluted in a manner which strengthened her suspicion that he was not of turkish origin although habited in the richest oriental costume she had ever seen and evidently holding some very superior office among the ottomans she returned his salutation with a graceful bow and a sweet smile and he immediately addressed her in the italian tongue her own dear and delightful language saying lady art thou the queen of this land or art thou as appearances would almost lead one to conjecture a solitary inhabitant here for he saw that she was alone beheld no traces of culture and there was but one miserable dwelling and that such as she might have built up with her own hands nisida shook her head mournfully making signs that she was deaf and dumb the mussulman chief uttered an ejaculation of mingled surprise and grief and surveyed the lady with additional interest and admiration but in a few moments his countenance assumed a sudden expression of astonishment as if a light had broken in upon him suggesting something more than a mere suspicion nay indeed a positive conviction and having examined her features with the most earnest attention he abruptly took his tablets from the fold of his garment and wrote something on them he then handed them to nisida and it was now her turn to experience the wildest surprise for on the page open to her view there were these words traced in a beautiful style of calligraphy and in the italian language is it possible that your ladyship can be the donna nisida of riverola nisida's eyes wandered in astonishment from the tablets to the countenance of him who had pencilled that question but his features were certainly not familiar to her and yet she thought that there was something in the general expression of that handsome face not altogether unknown to her as soon as she had partially recovered from the surprise and bewilderment produced by finding that she at least was known to the ottoman functionary she wrote beneath his question the following reply i am indeed nisida of riverola who for seven long months have been the only inhabitant of this island whereon i was shipwrecked and i am now anxious to return to italy or at all events to the first christian port of which your fleet may touch have mercy upon me then and take me hence but who are you signor that i should prove no stranger to you the ottoman chief read these words and hastened to reply in the following manner i have the honour to be the grand vizier of his imperial highness the glorious sultan soliman and my name is ibrahim a few months ago i encountered your brother francisco count of riverola 
who was then in command of a body of tuscan auxiliaries raised to assist in defending Rhodes against the invading arms of the mighty soliman your brother became my prisoner but i treated him worthily he informed me with bitter tears of the strange and mysterious disappearance of his well-beloved sister who had the misfortune to be deprived of the faculties of hearing and speech your brother was soon set free after the fall of Rhodes, and he returned to his native city but from all he told me of thee lady it was natural that i should ere now conjecture who thou must be ibrahim did not choose to add that he had remembered to have seen nisida occasionally in their native city of florence and that he was indeed the brother of her late dependent flora francatelli but the explanation which he did give was quite sufficient to renew her deepest surprise and she now learnt for the first time that during her absence her brother had been engaged in the perils of warfare the grand vizier gently withdrew from nisida's hand the tablets on which her eyes were positively riveted but it was only to trace a few lines to afford her additional explanations when he returned the tablets to her again she read as follows by a strange coincidence the glorious fleet which has wafted me hither to deliver you from this lonely isle and which is under the command of the captain pasha in person is bound for the western coast of italy its mission is at present known only to myself and a faithful greek dependent but your ladyship shall receive worthy attention and be duly conveyed to leghorn the squadron has been driven from its course by a tempest which assaulted us off the island of candia our pilot lost his reckonings and when land was descried this morning it was believed to be the coast of sicily hast thou lady any means of enlightening us as to the geographical position of this island nisida answered in the ensuing manner i have not the least notion of the geographical position of the island an eternal summer seems to prevail in this clime which would be terrestrial paradise were not the forests infested by hideous serpents of an enormous size ibrahim pasha having read this reply summoned from the barge the officer in command and to him he communicated the intelligence which he had just received from nisida that officer's countenance immediately underwent a dreadful change and falling on his knees at ibrahim's feet he made some strong appeal the nature of which nisida could only divine by his emphatic delivery and the terrified manner of the individual ibrahim smiled contemptuously and motioned the officer with an imperious gesture to raise and return to the barge then again having recourse to the tablets he conveyed the following information to nisida lady it appears that this is the isle of snakes situated in the gulf of sictra on the african coast horrible superstitions are attached to this clime and i dare not remain longer on its shore lest i should seriously offend the prejudices of those ignorant sailors come then lady you shall receive treatment due to your rank your beauty and your misfortunes in the meantime the officer had returned to the barge where whispers speedily circulated in respect to the land on which that boat had touched and the reader may imagine the extent of the loathing which the mere name of the isle was calculated to inspire in the breasts of the superstitious mussulmans when we observe that the existence of that island was well known to the turks and also to the africans but was left uninhabited and was never visited knowingly by any of their ships nisida saw that the grand vizier was in haste to depart not through any ridiculous fears on his part because he was too enlightened to believe in the fearful tales of mermaids genii ghouls vampires and other spirits by which the island was said to be haunted but because his renegadism had been of so recent a date that he dared not powerful and altered as he was afford the least ground for suspecting that the light of christianity triumphed in his soul over the dark barbarism of his assumed creed seeing then that ibrahim pasha was anxious to yield to the superstitious feelings of the sailors nisida intimated with a graceful bend of the head her readiness to accompany him but as she advanced toward the boat she cast a rapid and searching glance behind her alas wagner appeared not a feeling of uneasiness amounting almost to a pang of remorse took possession of her as she placed her foot upon the velvet covered plank and for an instant she hastened to proceed could she abandon ferdinand to the solitude of that isle could she renounce the joys which his love had taught her to experience and might she not be enabled to persuade him to make that sacrifice which would invest him with a power that she herself would direct and wield according to her own pleasure and suitably to her own interests but oh that hesitation lasted not more than a moment for her feet were on the plank leading to the barge and at a short distance floated the ship that would bear her away from the isle one longing lingering look upon the shore of that island where she had enjoyed so much happiness even as she had experienced so much anxiety one longing lingering look and she hesitated no more ibrahim escorted her to a seat beneath the velvet canopy the officer in command gave the signal and the barge was shoved off the rowers plied their oars and the island was already far behind 
ere Nisida had the courage to glance toward it again. End of section 59《Section 57 》Let us now return to Ferdinand Wagner, whom we left flying from his Nisida, flying in horror and alarm from her whom he nevertheless loved so tenderly and devotedly. He fled as if from the brink of the yawning pit of hell, into which the malignant fiend who coveted his soul was about to plunge him nor once did he look back absorbed as his feelings were in the full conviction of the tremendous peril from which he had just escaped he still found room for the reflection that were he to turn and catch but one glimpse of the beauteous oh too beauteous creature from whom he had torn himself away he should be lost his mind was bent upon the salvation of his immortal soul and he knew that the enemy of mankind was assailing him with a power and with an energy which nothing save the assistance of heaven could enable him to resist he knew also that heaven helps only those who are willing and anxious to help themselves and of this doctrine he had received a striking and triumphant proof in the sudden and effervescent appearance of his guardian angel at the instant when overpowered by the strong the earnest and the pathetic pleading of the sire and nisida he was about to proclaim his readiness to effect the crowning sacrifice and it was to avoid the chance of that direful yielding to fly from a temptation which became irresistible when embellished with all the eloquence of a woman on whom he doted that wagner sped with lightning rapidity toward the mountains but the beauteous form of nisida met not now his eyes and deeply profoundly ardently as he still loved her and felt that he must ever love her yet to speak soothly he deplored not that she was no longer there the vision of the previous night had so firmly established hope in his soul that he had prepared and tutored himself during his journey across the mountains to sacrifice all his happiness on earth to ensure the eternal felicity of heaven no nisida was not there but as he drew close to the shore he beheld to his ineffable joy the dark spot had gradually assumed that defined shape which left no room to doubt the truth of his vision even were he inclined to be sceptical for there indeed touching the strand but still so far in the water that a slight exertion would send it completely afloat was a large boat curiously shaped and painted in a variety of fantastic colours it had a mast standing but the sail was lowered and on a closer inspection the boat proved to be altogether unimpaired heaven delights to effect its vile intention by natural means thought wagner within himself but surely it could not have been through the agency of nisida that this boat was left upon the shore no he added aloud after a still closer inspection the rope attached to the prow has been snapped asunder doubtless the boat became detached from one of the ships which appeared off the island yesterday and which he said in a low murmuring voice and with an ill-subdued sigh have afforded nisida the means of departure hence he sat down exhausted and as he found leisure for recollection as his thoughts composed themselves and settled down into something like collected calmness he felt a sensation of indescribable joy at having triumphed over the appalling temptations which had beset him and in his soul a voice seemed to be singing an anthem of delight and gratitude and he soon experienced a serenity of mind such as he had not known for many hours past when a man having yielded to temptation succeeds in escaping the perils of the consequences he beholds a strong motive for self-gratulation but how ineffably more sweet is it to be able to reflect that the temptation itself has been avoided in the first instance and that the dangers of the results have never even been risked thus thought wagner but not for a moment did he attribute to any strength of mind on his own part the escape which had just been effected from the snare set by the evil one no he acknowledged within himself and with all due humility that the hand of the almighty had sustained him in his most trying moments of peril and ere he thought of resuming his journey to that side of the island on which nisida was not he knelt in fervent prayer rising from his knees his eyes accidentally swept the sea and he was riveted to the spot from which he was about to turn away for the white sails of the ottoman fleet met his astonished view he remained gazing on those objects for some time until he was convinced they were nearing the island for a few moments a deep regret took possession of him he should lose his nisida irrevocably 
but his next impulse was to wrestle with this feeling to combat this weakness how could he have hoped ever to rejoin her without rendering himself again liable to the witchery of her siren tongue the eloquence of her silver-toned voice the persuasiveness of her graceful manners no it were better that she should depart it were preferable that he should lose her and preserve his immortal soul thus reasoned he and that reasoning was effectual he waited only long enough to assure himself that the fleet was positively approaching the island he then knew that she would depart and without permitting himself to yield again to the weakness of nisida's fatal influence he tore himself away from that point amongst the heights which commanded the view of the side of the island where she was hastening around the base of the volcano he reached the defiles leading to that part of the isle where he had periodically fulfilled his dreadful destiny as a werewolf carefully avoiding the outskirts of the forest and the knots of large trees he proceeded toward the shore and his heart was rent with feelings of deep anguish as he everywhere beheld the traces of destruction left behind him by the recent run in the horrible form of a savage monster then too when melancholy thoughts had once again entered his soul the image of nisida appeared to flit before him in the most tempting manner and the more he endeavoured to banish from his memory the recollection of her charms the more vividly delineated did they become at length jealousy took possession of him and suddenly stopping short in his progress towards the shore he exclaimed aloud what if she should be wooed and run by another if she returned to her native land as assuredly she now will she may meet some handsome and elegant cavalier who will succeed in winning her passions and i i who love her so well shall be forgotten oh this is madness to think that another may possess her clasp her in his arms press his lips to hers feel her fragrant breath fan her cheek play with the rich tresses of her beauteous hair oh no no the bare thought is enough to goad me to despair she must not depart thus we have separated if not in anger at least abruptly too abruptly considering how we have loved and that we have wedded each other in the sight of heaven heaven repeated wagner his tone changing from despair to a deep solemnity heaven oh i rejoice that i gave utterance to the word for it reminds me that to regain my nisida i must lose heaven and as if to fly from his own reflections he rushed on toward the sea and there he stopped to gaze as oft before he had gazed on the mighty expanse seeming in the liquid sunlight as it stretched away from the yellow sand a resplendent lake of molten silver bounded by a golden shore how like to the human countenance art thou o mighty sea thought wagner as he stood with folded arms on the brink of the eternal waters now thou hast smiles as soft and dimples as beautiful as ever appeared in the face of innocence and youth while the joyous sunlight is on thee but if the dark clouds gather in the heaven above thee thou straightway assumed a mournful and a gloomy aspect and thou growest threatening and sombre and in how many varied voices dost thou speak o oh, treacherous and changeful sea now thou whisperest softly as if thy ripples conveyed faint murmurings of love but if the gale arise thou canst burst forth into notes of laughter as thy waters leap to the shore with bounding mirth and if the wind grow higher thou canst speak louder and more menacingly till when the storm comes on thou lashest thyself into a fury thou boilest with rage and thy wrathful voice lies with the rush of the tempest and the roar of the thunder deceitful sea imagining the beauties thoughts and passions of the earth within thy mighty depths too thou hast gems to deck the crowns of kings and the brows of loveliness and yet thou cravest for more more and engulfest rich argoses with all their treasures thou insatiate sea and in thy dark caverns are the skeletons of the myriads of human beings whom thou hast swallowed up in thy fury and whose bones are trophies which thou retainest in thy fathomless depths as the heart of man enshrineth the relics of those hopes which have wasted away and perished thus thought wagner as he stood gazing upon the sea then so calm and beautiful but which he knew to be so treacherous when wearied of the reflections which that scene inspired and not daring to allow his mind to dwell on the image of nisida he repaired to the nearest grove and refreshed himself with the cooling fruits which he plucked then he extended his rambles amongst the verdant plains and strove strenuously to divert his thoughts as much as possible from the one grand and mournful idea the departure of nisida from the island 
but vainly did he endeavour to fix his attention upon the enchanting characteristics of that clime the flowers appeared to him less brilliant in hue than they were wont to be the fruits were less inviting the verdure was of a less lively green and the plumage of the birds seemed to have lost the bright gloss that rendered its colours so gorgeous in the sunlight for oh the powers of his vision were almost completely absorbed in his mind and that mind was a mirror wherein was now reflected with a painful vividness all the incidents of the last few hours but he was still sustained in his determination not to retrace his way to the spot where he had left nisida when the several hours had passed and the sun was drawing near the western horizon he exclaimed in a moment of holy triumph she has doubtless by this time quitted the island and i have been enabled to resist those anxious longings which prompted me to return and clasp her in my arms o oh god i thank thee that thou hast given me this strength wagner now felt so overcome with weariness after his wanderings and roamings of so many hours especially as the two preceding nights had been sleepless for him that he sat down upon a piece of low rock near the shore a quiet dreamy repose insensibly stole over him in a few minutes his slumber was profound and now he beheld a strange vision gradually the darkness which appeared to surround him grew less intense and a gauzy vapour that rose in the midst at first of the palest bluish tint possible by degrees obtained more consistency when its nature began to undergo a sudden change assuming the semblance of a luminous mist wagner's heart seemed to flutter and leap in his breast as if with a presentiment of coming joy for the luminous mist became a glorious halo surrounding the beauteous and holy form of a protecting angel clad in white and shining garments and with snowy wings drooping slowly from her shoulders and ineffably supernally benign and reassuring was the look which the angel bent upon the sleeping wagner as she said in the softest most melodious tones the choir of heavenly host has hymned thanks for thy salvation after thou hast resisted the temptations of the enemy of mankind when he spoke to thee with his own lips an angel came to thee in a dream to give thee assurances that thou hadst already done much in atonement for the crime that endangered thy soul but he warned thee then that much more remained to be done ere that atonement would be complete and the rest is now accomplished for thou hast resisted the temptations of the evil one when urged by the tongue and in the melodious voice of lovely woman this was thy crowning triumph and the day when thou shalt reap thy reward is near at hand for the bonds which connect thee with the destiny of a werewolf shall be broken and thy name shall be inscribed in heaven's own book of life and i will give thee a sign that what thou seest and hearest now in my slumber is no idle and delusive vision conjured up by a fevered brain the sign shall be this on awakening from thy sleep retrace thy way to the spot where this morning thou didst separate from her whom thou lovest, and there shalt thou find a boat upon the sand the boat will waft thee to sicily and there in the town of syracuse thou must inquire for a man whose years have numbered one hundred and sixty-two for that man it is who will teach thee how the spell which has made thee a werewolf may be broken scarcely had the angel finished speaking when a dark form rose suddenly near that heavenly being and wagner had no difficulty in recognizing the demon but the enemy of mankind appeared not armed with terrors of countenance nor with the withering scorn of infernal triumph for a moment his features denoted ineffable rage and then that expression yielded to one of the profoundest melancholy as if he were saying within himself there is salvation for a repentant man but none for me a cloud now seemed to sweep before wagner's eyes denser and more dense it grew first absorbing in its increasing obscurity the form of the demon and then enveloping the radiant being who still continued to smile sweetly and benignly upon the sleeping mortal until the glorious countenance and the shining garments were no longer visible but all was black darkness around and ferdinand wagner continued to sleep profoundly many hours elapsed ere he woke and his slumber was serene and soothing at length when he opened his eyes and slowly raised his head from the hard pillow which a mass of rock had formed he beheld the rich red streaks in the eastern horizon heralding the advent of the sun and as the various features of the island gradually developed themselves to his view as if breaking slowly from a mist he collected and rearranged in his mind all the details of the strange vision which he had seen for a few minutes he was oppressed with a fear that his vision would indeed prove the delusive sport of his fevered brain for there seemed to be in its component parts a wild admixture of the sublime and the fantastic 
the solemn language of the angel appeared strangely diversified from the intimation that he would find a boat upon the shore that this boat would convey him to a place where he was to inquire for a man whose age was one hundred and sixty-two years and that this man was the being destined to save him from the doom of a werewolf then again he thought that heaven worked out its designs by means often inscrutable to human comprehension and he blamed himself for having doubted the truth of the vision feelings of joy therefore accompanied the reassurance of his soul and having poured forth his thanksgivings for the merciful intervention of providence on his behalf he tarried not even to break his fast with the fruits clustering at a short distance from him but hastened to retrace his way across the mountains no longer doubting to find the sign fulfilled and the boat upon the shore and now these thoughts rose within him should he again behold nisida was the fleet which she had seen on the previous day still off the island or had it departed bearing nisida away to another clime he expected not to behold either the fleet or his loved one for he felt convinced that the angel would not send him back within the influence of her temptations nor was he mistaken for having traversed the volcanic range of heights he beheld naught to break the uniform and monotonous aspect of the sunlit sea but on drawing nearer to the shore he saw a dark spot almost immediately in front of the little hut which nisida and himself had constructed wherein they had passed so many many happy hours he now advanced with a beating heart to the hut the door was closed was it possible that nisida might be within oh how weak in purpose is the strongest minded of mortals for an instant a pleasing hope filled wagner's breast and then again summoning all his resolutions to his aid he opened the door resolved should she indeed be there to remain proof against all the appeals she might make to induce him to sacrifice their mundane prosperity for his immortal soul but the hut was empty he lingered in it for a few moments and the reminiscences of happy hours passed therein swept across his brain suddenly the note which nisida had left for him met his eyes and it would be representing him as something far more or else far less than human were we to declare he did not experience a feeling of intense pleasure at beholding the memorial of her love the tears flowed down his cheeks as he read the following lines the hour approaches dearest ferdinand when in all probability i shall quit the island but think not that this hope is unaccompanied by severe pangs oh thou knowest that i love thee and i will return to thee my own adored ferdinand so soon as my presence shall be no longer needed at florence yes i will come back to thee and we will not part until death shall deprive thee of me for i must perish first and while thou still remainest in all the glory of regenerated youth alas thou hast fled from me this morning in anger perhaps in disgust but thou wilt forgive me ferdinand if yielding to some strange influence which i could not control i urge an appeal so well calculated to strike terror into thy soul oh that i could embrace thee ere i leave this isle but alas thou comest not back thou hast fled to the mountains it is however in the ardent hope of thy return to this spot that i leave these few lines to assure thee of my undying affection to pledge to thee my intention to hasten back to thine arms as soon as possible and to implore thee not to nourish anger against thy devoted nisida wagner placed the letter to his lips exclaiming oh therefore did an evil influence ever prove its power on thee thou loving loved and beauteous being why was thy hand raised against the hapless agnes therefore did fate make thee a murderess and why oh why didst thou assail me with prayers tears reproaches menaces to induce me to consign my soul to satan nisida may heaven manifest its merciful goodness unto thee even as that same benign care has been extended to me ferdinand then placed the letter in his bosom next to his heart and dashing away the tears from his long lashes began to turn his attention toward the preparation for his own departure from the island as he approached the pile of stores he beheld the light drapery which nisida had lately worn but which she had laid aside previous to leaving the island and he also observed that the rich dress which he had often seen her examine with care was no longer there how beauteous she must have appeared in the garb he murmured to himself but alas she returns to the great world to resume her former character of the deaf and dumb nisida and himself had often employed themselves in gathering quantities of those fruits which form an excellent aliment when dried in the sun and there was a large supply of these comestibles now at his disposal he accordingly transferred them to the boat then he procured a quantity of fresh fruits 
and lastly he filled with pure water a cask which had been saved by nisida from the corsair wreck his preparations were speedily completed and he was about to depart when it struck him that he might never behold nisida again and that she might perform her promise of returning to the island sooner or later he accordingly availed himself of the writing materials left amongst the stores to pen a brief but affectionate note couched in the following terms dearest nisida i have found read and wept over thy letter thou hast my sincerest forgiveness because i love thee more than man ever before loved woman heaven has sent me the means of escape from this island and the doom at which my regenerated existence was purchased will shortly lose its spell but perhaps my life may be surrendered up at the same time at all events everything is dark and mysterious in respect to means by which that spell is to be broken should we never meet again but shouldst thou return hither and find this note receive it as a proof of the unchanging affection of thy ferdinand the letter was placed in the hut in precisely the same spot where the one written by nisida had been left and wagner then hastened to the boat which he had no difficulty in pushing away from the shore without being able to form any idea of the direction in which the island of sicily lay but trusting entirely to the aid of heaven to guide him to the coast whither his destiny now required him to proceed he hoisted the sail and abandoned the boat to the gentle breeze which swept the surface of the mediterranean End of section sixty. Section sixty one of Wagner the Werewolf by George W. M. Reynolds. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter fifty seven, part two. The state cabins, they might more properly be called spacious apartments, occupied by the Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha on board the ship of the Lord High Admiral, were fitted up in a most sumptuous and luxurious manner. They consisted of two large saloons in a suite and from each of which opened on either side a number of small cabins tenanted by the officers immediately attached to the grand vizier's person and the page and slaves in attendance on him the first of the two large saloons was lighted by a handsome conical skylight on the deck the innermost had the advantage of the stern windows the drapery the curtains the carpets the sofas and the hangings were all of the richest materials the sides and ceilings of the cabin were beautifully painted and elaborately gilded and the woodwork of the windows was encrusted with thin slabs of variously coloured marbles on which were engraved the ciphers of the different lord high admirals who had hoisted their flags at any time on board that ship for well, the state apartments which we are describing properly belonged to the capitan pasha himself but they had been surrendered to the grand vizier as a mark of respect to the superior rank of this minister during his stay on board the little cabins communicating with the large saloons were in reality intended to accommodate the ladies of the capitan pasha's harem but ibrahim did not turn them to a similar use because it was contrary to ottoman usage for the princess aistia being the sultan's sister to accompany her husband on any expedition and he had received so menacing a warning in the fate of calanthe not to revoke the jealousy of aistia or the vengeance of her mother the sultana valida that he had brought none of the ladies of his own harem with him indeed since the violent death of calanthe the harem had been maintained at constantinople rather as an appendage of high rank than as a source of sensual enjoyment nisida of riverola was treated with the utmost deference and attention by the grand vizier ibrahim pasha and on reaching the lord high admiral's ship she was instantly conducted to the innermost saloon which she was given to understand by signs would be exclusively appropriated to her own use the slaves occupying the small cabins opening therefrom were removed to another part of the ship and the key of the door connecting the two saloons was handed by the polite ibrahim to the lady as, as a guarantee or at least an apparent one of the respect with which she should be treated and the security she might hope to enjoy the fleet weighed anchor and set sail again almost immediately after the return of the grand vizier to the admiral's ship and as she was wafted away from the island of snakes nisida sat at the window of her splendid saloon gazing at the receding shores and so strangely balancing between her anxiety to revisit florence and her regrets at abandoning ferdinand wagner that while smiles were on her lips tears were in her eyes and if her bosom palpitated with joy at one moment it would heave with profound sighs at the next in the afternoon four male slaves entered nisida's cabin and spread upon the table a magnificent repast accompanied with the most delicious wines of cyprus and greece 
and while the lady partook slightly of the banquet two of the slaves appeared and danced in a pleasing style for several minutes they retired but shortly returned carrying in their hands massive silver censers in which burnt aloes cinnamon and other odoriferous woods diffused a delicious perfume around the four slaves who attended at table removed the dishes on splendid silver salvers and then served sherbet and a variety of delicious fruits and when the repast was terminated they all withdrew leaving nisida once more alone the island of snakes had been lost sight of for some hours and the fresh breeze of evening was playing upon the cheeks of the lady nisida as she sat at the open casement of her splendid saloon watching the ships that followed in the wake of that in which she was when the sounds of voices in the adjacent cabin attracted her attention and as the partition was but slight and the persons discoursing spoke italian she could not help overhearing the conversation which there took place even if she had possessed any punctilious feelings to have prevented her from becoming a willing listener the lady nisida is a magnificent woman demetrius observed a voice which our heroine immediately recognized to be that of the grand vizier such a splendid aquiline countenance i never before beheld such eyes too such a delicious mouth and such brilliant teeth what a pity it is that she has not the use of her tongue the voice of such a glorious creature speaking mine own dear italian language would be music itself and how admirably is she formed upon somewhat too large a scale perhaps to precisely suit my taste and yet the contours of her shape are so well rounded so perfectly proportioned in the most harmonious symmetry that were she the less of the hebe she would be less charming is your highness already enamoured of donna nisida asked the person to whom the grand vizier had addressed the preceding observations i must confess that i am demetrius replied ibrahim i would give a year of my life to become her favoured lover for one day but considering that i hope to see my sister flora become the wife of donna nisida's brother francisco i must restrain this passion of mine within due bounds but wherefore do you sigh thus heavily demetrius alas my lord the mention you make of your sister reminded me that i once possessed a sister also returned the greek in a plaintive tone but when i returned to constantinople i sought vainly for her and heaven knows what has become of her and whether i shall ever see her more poor calanthe some treachery has doubtless been practised towards thee don't give way to despair demetrius said the grand vizier who knows but calanthe may have espoused some youth on whom her affections were set ah my lord interrupted the greek it is considerate it is a kind on the part of your highness to suggest such a consolatory belief but calanthe would not keep an honourable bridal secret yet better were it that she should be dead that she should have been basely murdered by some ruthless robber than that she should live dishonoured however i will not intrude my griefs upon your highness although the friendship and the condensation which your highness manifests towards me emboldens me to mention these sorrows in your presence would that i could really console thee demetrius answered ibrahim with well-affected sincerity for thou hast shown thyself a sincere friend to my poor sister flora and now that we are alone together demetrius for almost the first time since this hastily undertaken voyage began let us recapitulate in detail all the occurrences which have led me to enter upon the present expedition the real nature of which you alone know save my imperial master and moreover let us continue to discourse in italian for thou canst speak that language more fluently than i can express myself in thy native greek besides it rejoices my heart he added with a sigh to converse in a tongue so dear as that of the land which gave me birth and if donna nisida only knew that in the representative of the mighty soliman she had beholden the brother of her late menial flora how surprised would she be and it were not prudent that she should learn that fact my lord observed demetrius for more reasons than one since from sundry hints which the signora francatelli your lordship's worthy aunt dropped to me it is easy to believe that the donna nisida was averse to the attachment which her brother francisco had formed and that her ladyship indeed was the means of consigning your highness's sister to the convent of the carmelites alibe i shall not treat count francisco's sister the less worthily now that she is in my power said ibrahim pasha indeed her matchless beauty would command my forbearance were i inclined to be vindictive moreover deaf and dumb as she is she could not obtain the least insight into my plans 
and therefore she is unable to thwart them the reader may suppose that not one single word of all this conversation was lost upon nisida who had indeed learnt with the most unbounded wonderment that the high and mighty grand vizier of the ottoman empire a man enjoying an almost sovereign rank and who bore a title which placed him on a level with the greatest princes of christendom was the brother of the detested flora francatelli during a short pause which ensued in the dialogue between ibrahim pasha and his greek confidant nisida stole gently up to the door in the partitions between the two saloons so fearful was she of losing a single word of a discourse that so deeply interested and nearly concerned her but as i was saying ere now demetrius resumed the grand vizier who young as he was had acquired all the methodical habits of a wise statesman let us examine in detail the whole posture of affairs in florence so that i may maturely consider the precise bearings of the case and finally determine how to act for although i have at my disposal a fleet which might cope with even that of enterprising england or imperious france though twenty thousand well-disciplined soldiers on board these ships are ready to draw the sword at my nod and though as the seraskier and scythe halter of the armies of the sultan i am responsible for my actions to his majesty alone yet it is not a small thing demetrius to march an invading force into the heart of italy and thereby risk a war with all christendom therefore let us pause to reflect upon every detail of all those incidents which occurred two months ago in florence good my lord said demetrius i will therefore begin with my arrival in that fair city to which i repaired with all possible dispatch as soon as i had received the instructions of your highness it would appear that the lord count of riverola reached florence the same day as myself he having been detained at the outset of his voyage home from rhodes by contrary winds and a severe storm it was somewhat late in the evening when i called at the cottage of the signora francatelli your highness's worthy aunt for i previously passed a few hours in instituting by indirect means as many inquiries concerning her circumstances and welfare as could be prudently made to my grief however i could not ascertain any tidings concerning your highness's sister and i therefore came to the mournful conclusion that her disappearance still remained unaccounted for pondering upon the sad tidings which in this respect i should have to forward to your highness and having already devised a fitting tale whereby to introduce myself to your lordship's aunt i went to the cottage which as i heard in the course of a subsequent conversation don francisco of riverola had just quitted your highness's aunt received me with as much cordiality as she could well show toward a stranger then in accordance with my prearranged method of procedure i stated i was sent by the son of a debtor to the estate of the late signor francatelli to repay any of his surviving relations a large sum of money which had been so long so very long going and the loss of which at the time had mainly contributed to plunge signor francatelli into embarrassment i added that the son of the debtor having grown rich had deemed it an act of duty and honour to liquidate this liability on the part of his deceased father my tale was believed the case of jewels which i had previously caused to be estimated by a goldsmith in florence was received by the means of settling the fictitious debt and i was forthwith a welcome friend at the worthy lady's table the stratagem was a good one demetrius observed the grand vizier but proceed and fear not that thou wilt weary me with lengthened details i stay to partake of the evening repast continued the greek and the signora francatelli grew confiding and communicative as was nothing more than natural inasmuch as i necessarily appeared in the light of the agent of a worthy and honourable man who had not forgotten the obligation to a family that had suffered by his father's conduct i assured the signora that the person by whom i was employed to liquidate that debt would be rejoiced to hear of the success of the francatellis and i ventured to make inquiries concerning the orphan children of the late merchant proceed demetrius said the grand vizier spare not a single detail your highness shall be obeyed return the greek they now speaking with considerable diffidence the worthy lady shook her head mournfully observing that alessandro the son of the late merchant was in turkey she believed and then she rose hastily and opening a door leading to a staircase called her niece to descend as there was only a friend present i was overjoyed to learn thus unexpectedly that the signora flora had reappeared and when she thus entered the room could scarcely conceal my delight beneath that aspect of mere cold courtesy which it became a stranger to wear 
the young lady appeared perfectly happy and no wonder for when she had retired after staying a few minutes in the room her good aunt in the fullness of her confidence in me not only related all the particulars of the signora flora's immurement in the carmelite convent but also explained to me her motives for so long concealing the young lady's return home as i have heretofore narrated to your highness the worthy aunt then informed me that the count of riverola had only returned that day from the wars that he had made honourable proposals to her on behalf of the signora flora and that it was intended to sustain the mystery which veiled the young lady's existence and safety in the cottage until the marriage should have been privately effected when it would be too late for the count's friends to interfere or renew their persecutions against your lordship's sister your highness's aunt dropped hints intimating her suspicions that the lady nisida was the principal if not indeed the sole means of those persecutions which had consigned the innocent young maiden to the carmelite convent and the more i reflect on this point in view of all i know of the affairs and of donna nisida's strange and resolute character the more i am convinced that she really perpetrated that diabolical outrage were it not for young francisco's sake and that i should bring dishonour into a family with which my sister will i hope be soon connected with marriage ties exclaimed ibrahim i would avenge myself for my sister's wrongs by forcing the cruel nisida to yield herself to my arms but no it must not be and nisida who overheard every syllable curled her lips while her eyes flashed fire at the dark menace which the renegade had dared to utter qualified though it were by the avowal of the motive which would prevent him from putting it into execution no it must not be repeated ibrahim and yet she is so wondrously beautiful that i would risk a great deal to win her love but proceed demetrius we now come to that portion of the narrative which so nearly concerns my present proceedings yes my lord and god give your highness success exclaimed the young greek having taken leave of your excellent aunt who invited me to visit her again as i had casually observed that business would detain me in florence for some time and having promised the strictest secrecy relative to all she had told me i repaired to the inn at which i had put up intending to devote the next day to writing the details of all those particulars which i have just related and which i purpose to send by some special messenger to your highness but it then struck me that i should only attract undue attention to myself by conducting at a public tavern a correspondence having so important an aspect and i accordingly rose very early in the morning to sally forth to seek after a secluded but respectable lodging i eventually obtained suitable apartments in the house of a widow named dame margaretha and there i immediately took up my abode having written my letters to your highness i was anxious to get them expedited to constantinople for i was well aware that your highness would be rejoiced to hear that your beloved sister was indeed in the land of the living that she was in good health and that a brilliant marriage was in store for her i accordingly spoke to dame margaretha relative to the means of obtaining a trusty messenger who would undertake a journey to constantinople the old woman assured me that her son antonio who was a valet in the service of the count of arestino would be able to procure me such a messenger as i desired and in the course of the day that individual was fetched by his mother to speak to me on the subject having repeated my wishes to him he asked me several questions which seemed to indicate a prying disposition and a curiosity as impertinent as it was inconvenient in fact i did not like his manner at all but conceiving that his conduct might arise from sheer ignorance and from no sinister motive i still felt inclined to avail myself of his assistance to procure a messenger finding that he could not sift me he at length said he had no doubt a friend of his whom he named venturo would undertake my commission and he promised to return with that individual in the evening he then left me and true to his promise he came back shortly after dusk accompanied by this same venturo the bargain was soon struck between us and he promised to set off that very night for rimini whence vessels were constantly sailing for constantinople i gave him a handsome son in advance and also a sealed packet addressed to your highness's private secretary but containing an enclosure also well sealed directed to your highness for i did not choose to excite the curiosity of these italians by allowing them to discover that i was corresponding with the grand vizier of the ottoman empire venturo accordingly left me promising to acquit himself faithfully on his mission your plans were all wisely taken said the grand vizier and no human foresight could have anticipated other than successful results proceed for although you have hastily sketched all these particulars to me before yet i am anxious to consider them in more attentive detail 
having thus disposed of that important business resumed the young greek i went out to saunter through the streets of florence and while away an hour or two in viewing the splendid appearance of that charming city when lighted up with the innumerable lamps of its palaces and casinos at length i entered a dark and obscure street which i knew must lead toward the river i had not proceeded far down the street when i heard the sound of many steps rapidly approaching as if of a patrol i stepped aside under a deep archway but as chance would have it they stopped short within a few paces of the spot where i was shrouded in the utter obscurity of the arch i should have immediately passed on my way but was induced to stop by hearing a voice which i recognised to be that of venturo whom i believed to be already some miles away from florence i was perfectly astounded by this discovery and if i entertained any doubts as to the identity of that voice they were speedily cleared up by the conversation between the men we had better separate here said venturo and break into at least two parties as at the bottom of this street we shall come within the blaze of the lights of the casinos on the arno's bank well spoken returned a voice which to my increasing wonder i recognised to be that of antonio my landlady's son you and i venturo will keep together and our friends can go on first we will follow them in a few minutes and then unite again at the angle of the grove nearest to dame francatelli's cottage what say you lomellino just as you think fit antonio returned a third person whom i naturally concluded to be the individual addressed as lomellino you or rather your master the count of aristino pays for this business and so i am bound to obey you listen then resumed antonio the young count of riverola whom i have traced to the cottage this evening will no doubt be coming away about the time we shall all meet down there and therefore we shall have nothing to do but to carry him off to the cave why is the count of arestino so hostile to the young riverola demanded the man who had answered to the name of lomellino he cares nothing about young riverola either one way or the other replied antonio but i persuaded his lordship that if francesco be left at large he will only use his influence to mitigate the vengeance of the law against the countess guilia who is the friend of flora francatelli and so the count of arestino has consented to follow my advice and have francisco locked up until the inquisition has dealt with the countess her lover the marquis of orsini and the francatelli's aunt and niece then you have a spite against this man said lomellino truly have i responded antonio you remember that night when you with stefano verina and piero got into the riverola palace some months ago well i don't know who discovered the plot but i was locked in my room and the next morning young francisco dismissed me in a way that made me his mortal enemy and i must have vengeance for this purpose i have urged on the count to cause flora francatelli whom francisco loves and wishes to marry to be included in the proceedings taken by the inquisition at his lordship's instigation against the countess guilia and the marquis d'orsini and the old aunt must necessarily be thrown in into the bargain for harbouring sacrilegious persons and so francisco is to lose his mistress flora and be kept a prisoner in the cavern till he has been condemned along with the others said lomellino neither more nor less than what you imagine and i only wish i had the lady nisida also in my power for i have no doubt she instigated her brother to turn me off suddenly like a common thief because from all you have since told me lomellino i dare swear it was she who got an inkling of our intentions to plunder the riverola palace though how she could have done so being deaf and dumb passes my understanding well well growled lomellino it is of no use to waste time talking of the past let us only think of the present come my men we will go on first as already agreed three or four armed ruffians then put themselves in motion passing close by the place where i was concealed but fortunately without discovering my presence oh those miscreants would have assuredly murdered you my faithful demetrius said the grand vizier of that my lord there is little doubt returned the young greek and i must confess that i shuddered more than once while listening to the discourse of the cold-blooded monsters but venturio and antonio still remained behind for a few minutes and the discourse which took place between them gave me still further insight into the characters of the gang well venturo said antonio after a short pause have you examined the packet which was entrusted to you i have and the contents are written in greek or arabic or some such outlandish tongue for i could not read a word of them answered venturo and so i thought the best plan was to destroy them you acted wisely observed antonio by the saints 
it was a good thought of mine to introduce you to my mother's lodger as a trustworthy messenger if he only knew that we had shared his gold and were laughing at him for his credulity he would not be over well pleased his purse appears to be pretty well lined and when we have got all our present business off our hands we will devote our attention to the lodger the arno is deep and a foreigner the less in the city will not be noticed not at all answered venturo but let us now hasten to join our companions at what time are the officers of the inquisition to visit the cottage they are no doubt already in the neighbourhood replied antonio and will pounce upon their victims as soon as young francisco leaves the place another set of officers are after the marquis of orsini the two miscreants then departed continuing their conversation in a low tone as they went along the street but i overheard no more the wretches exclaimed the grand vizier in an excited voice but vengeance will light upon them yet heaven grant that they may not go unpunished said demetrius your highness may imagine the consternation with which i had listened to the development of the damnable plot then in progress but i nevertheless experienced a material solace in the fact that accident had thus revealed to me the whole extent of the danger which menaced those whom your highness held dear without pausing to deliberate i resolved at all risks to proceed at once to the cottage and if not too late to warn your aunt and lovely sister of a terrible danger which menaced them nay more i determined to remove them immediately from florence that very night without an unnecessary moment's delay darting along the streets as if my speed involved matters of life and death i succeeded in passing the two villains venturo and antonio before they had entered the sphere of the brilliant illuminations of the casinos of the vale of arno and i heard one say to the other there's some cowardly knave who has just done a deed of which he is no doubt afraid convinced by this remark that they suspected not who the person that passed them so rapidly was i hurried on with increasing speed and likewise with augmented hope to be enabled to save not only your lordship's aunt and sister from the officers of the inquisition but also the young count of riverola from the power of his miscreant enemies alas my anticipations were not to be fulfilled i lost my way amongst a maze of gardens connected with the villas bordering on the arno and much valuable time at such a crisis was wasted in the circuits which i had to make to extricate myself from the labyrinth and reach the bank of the river at length i drew within sight of the cottage but my heart beat with terrible alarms as i beheld lights moving rapidly about the house it is too late i thought and yet i rushed on toward the place but suddenly the door opened and by a glare of light within i saw three females closely muffled in veils led forth by several armed men it instantly struck me that the third must be the countess guilio of aristino to whom i heard the miscreants allude i stopped short for i knew that any violent demonstration or interference on my part would be useless and that measures of another kind must be adopted on behalf of the victims as the procession now advanced from a cottage i concealed myself in the adjacent grove wondering whether count francisco had been already arrested or whether he had managed to elude his enemies the procession consisting of the officers of the inquisition with their three female prisoners who were dragged rather than led along passed by the spot where i lay concealed and the deep sobs which came from the unfortunate ladies gagged though they evidently were filled my heart with horror and anguish as soon as they had disappeared i struck further into the grove knowing by its situation the outlet on the other side would conduct me to the nearest road to that quarter of the city in which i lodged but scarcely had i reached the outskirts of the little wood in the direction which i had named when i saw a party of men moving on in front of me through the obscurity of the night it struck me that this party might consist of antonio venturo and other worthies and i determined to ascertain whether count francisco had fallen into their hands i accordingly followed them as cautiously as possible taking care to skirt the grove in such a manner that i was concealed by its deep shade whereas those whom i was watching proceeded further away from the trees thus the party in advance and myself continued our respective paths for nearly a quarter of an hour during which i ascertained beyond all doubt that the men whom i was following were really the villains of the antonio gang and that they had a prisoner with them who could be no other than the count of riverola at length the grove terminated and i was about to abandon further pursuit as dangerous when it struck me that i should be acting in a cowardly and an unworthy manner not to endeavour to ascertain the locality of the cave of which i had heard the miscreant speak and to which they were most probably conveying him who was so dear to the beautiful signora flora accordingly i managed to trek the party across several fields to a grove of evergreens 
but as they advanced without caring how they broke through the crackling thickets the noise of their movements absorbed the far fainter sounds which accompanied my progress so successful was my undertaking that i was soon within twenty paces of them but it was profoundly dark and i was unable to observe their movements i computed the distance they were from me and calculated so as to form an idea of the exact spot where they were standing for by an observation which one of the villains let drop i learnt that they had reached the entrance of their cavern it also struck me that i had heard a bell ring as if in the depths of the earth and i concluded that this was a signal to obtain admittance while i was weighing these matters in my mind lomellino suddenly exclaimed let the prisoner be taken down first and have a care venturo that the bandage is well fastened all right captain was the reply and i thus ascertained that lomellino was a chief of some band most probably i thought of robbers for i remembered the allusions which had been made that evening by antonio to a certain predatory visit some months previously to the riverona mansion god help francisco i said within myself as i reflected upon the desperate character of the men who had him in his power and then i was consoled by the remembrance that he was merely to be detained as a prisoner for a period and not harmed unfortunately such demons as those florentine banditti are capable of every atrocity observed the grand vizier truly my lord observed demetrius but let us hope that all those in whom your highness is interested will yet be saved i shall however continue my narrative three or four minutes had elapsed since the robbers had come to a full stop when i knew by the observations made amongst them that they were descending into some subterranean place i accordingly waited with the uttermost anxiety until i was convinced that they had all disappeared with their prisoner and then i crept cautiously along to the place at which i had already reckoned them to have paused i stooped down and carefully felt upon the ground until i was enabled to ascertain the precise point at which the marks of their footsteps had ceased at this moment a moon shone forth with such extreme brilliancy that its beams penetrated the thick foliage and i now observed with horror that i had advanced to the very verge of a steep precipice on the brink of which the grove suddenly ceased had not the moon thus providentially appeared at that instant i should have continued to grope about in the utter darkness and have assuredly fallen into the abyss i breathed a fervent prayer for this signal deliverance but not a trace of any secret entrance to a cavern could i find no steps no trap-door well aware that it would be dangerous for me to be caught in that spot should any of the banditti emerge suddenly from their cave i was reluctantly compelled to depart but before i quitted the place i studied it so well that i should have no difficulty in recognising it again in fact just at the precise spot where the footsteps of the banditti ceased an enormous chestnut tree which for more than a century must have continued to draw from the earth its nourishment sloped completely over the precipice while on the right of this tree as you face the abyss is a knot of olives and on the left an umbrageous line these features of the spot i committed to memory with the idea that such a clue to the robber's retreat might not eventually prove useless i will extirpate that nest of vipers that horde of remorseless banditti exclaimed ibrahim pasha in a tone indicative of strong excitement your highness has the power responded demetrius but the florentine authorities must be completely impotent in respect to such a formidable horde of lawless men the remainder of my narrative is soon told my lord returned the young greek i returned to my lodgings in safety but determined not to remain there a single hour longer than necessary for apart from the resolve which i had formed already in consequence of the various and unforeseen incidents which had occurred to return to constantinople the murderous designs of antonio and ventura in respect to myself would have hastened my removal at all events to another lodging that night sleep never visited my eyes so amazed and grieved was i at the calamities which had befallen those who were so dear to your highness very early in the morning i arose from a feverish bed and sallied forth to learn tidings of the marquis of orsino for thought i if this nobleman had escaped arrest by the officers of the inquisition he might be enabled to effect somewhat in aiding the female victims but i heard at his dwelling that he had been arrested the previous evening on a charge of sacrilege perpetrated with others in respect to the carmelite convent frustrated in this quarter i repaired to the principal clerk of the criminal tribunal and inquired the name and address of a lawyer of eminence and repute the clerk complied with my demand and recommended to me angelo joras the brother of the celebrated florentine physician both of whom are known to me by name observed the grand vizier and angelo duras is a man of unblemished integrity it delights me to know you employed him 
i found him too continued demetrius a kind-hearted and benevolent man he received me with affability and i narrated to him as much as necessary of the particulars which i have detailed to your highness without stating by whom i was employed i merely represented to him that i was deeply interested in the francatelli family and that it was of the utmost importance to obtain a delay for two or three months in the criminal proceedings instituted against those innocent females as in the meantime i should undertake a journey to a place at some considerable distance but the result of which would prove materially beneficial to the cause of the accused he observed that the interest of the count of arestino who would doubtless endeavour to hasten the proceedings in order to wreak speedy vengeance upon his wife and the marquis of orsini was very powerful to contend against but that gold could accomplish much i assured him that there would be no lack of funds to sustain even the most expensive process and i threw down a heavy purse as an earnest of my ability to bear the cost of the suit he committed to paper all the particulars that i had thought it prudent to reveal to him and after some consideration said i now see my way very clearly i will undertake that the final hearing of this case at least so far as it regards the francatellis shall be postponed for three months you may rely upon the fulfilment of this promise let the count of arestino do his worst thus assured i quitted the worthy pleader and proceeded to visit father marco who as i had happened to learn when in conversation with your highness's aunt was a family confessor i found that excellent man overwhelmed with grief at the calamities which had occurred and to him i confided under a solemn promise of inviolable secrecy who the present grand vizier of the ottoman empire really was and how i had been employed by you to visit florence for the purpose of watching over the safety of your relatives i however explained to father marco that his vow of secrecy was to cease to be binding at any moment where the lives of the francatelli should be menaced by circumstances that might possibly arise in spite of all the precautions that i had adopted to postpone the final hearing of their cause and that should imminent peril menace those lives he was immediately to reveal to the duke of florence the fact of the relationship of the francatellis with one who has power to punish any injury that might be done to them though well knowing my lord the obstinacy of the christian states in venturing to beard ottoman might i considered this precaution to be at all events a prudent one and father marco promised to obey my injunctions in all respects i was not mistaken in thee demetrius said the grand vizier when i chose thee for that mission on account of thy discreetness and foresight your highness's praises are my best reward answered the greek i have now done all that i could possibly effect to devise under the circumstances which prompted me to think or act and it grieved me that i was unable to afford the slightest assistance to the young count of riverola but i dared not wait longer in italy and i was convinced that the authorities in florence were too inefficient to root out the horde of banditti even had i explained to them the clue which i myself obtained to the stronghold of those miscreants i accordingly quitted florence in the afternoon of the day following the numerous arrests which i have mentioned and had i not been detained so long at rimini by adverse winds your highness would not have been kept for so many weeks without the mournful tidings which it was at length my painful duty to communicate in person to your lordship that delay my faithful demetrius said the grand vizier was no fault of thine fortunately the squadron was already equipped for sea and instead of repairing to the african frontier to chastise the daring pirates it is on its way to the tuscan coast where if need be it will land twenty thousand soldiers to liberate my relations and the young count of riverola a pretext for making war upon the italian states has been afforded by their recent conduct in sending auxiliaries to the succour of Rhodes. and of that excuse i shall not hesitate to avail myself to commence hostilities against the proud florentines should a secret and peaceful negotiation fail but now that thou hast recapitulated to me all those particulars which thou didst merely sketch forth at first it seems to me fitting that i anchor the fleet at the mouth of the arno and that i send thee demetrius as an envoy in a public capacity but in reality to stipulate privately for the release of those in whom i am interested thus terminated the conference between ibrahim pasha and his greek dependent a conference which had revealed manifold and astounding occurrences to the ears of the lady nisida of riverola astounding indeed francisco in the hands of the formidable banditti flora in the prison of the inquisition and the ottoman grand vizier bent upon effecting the marriage which nisida abhorred 
these tidings were sufficient to arouse all the wondrous energies of that mind which was so prompt in combining intrigues and plots so resolute in carrying them out and so indomitable when it had formed a will of its own ominous were the fires which flashed in her large dark eyes and powerful were the workings of those emotions which caused her heaving bosom to swell as if about to burst with the bodice which confined it when retreating from the partition floor between the two saloons and resuming her seat at the cabin windows to permit the evening breeze to fan her fevered cheek nisa thought within herself it was indeed time that i should quit that accursed island and return to italy End of section 61section sixty two of wagner the werewolf by george w m reynolds this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifty eight the roseate streaks which the departing glories of a mediterranean sunset left lingering for a few minutes in the western horizon were yielding to the deeper gloom of the evening a few days after the scene related in the preceding chapter as Nisida rose from her seat at the open windows of her splendid saloon on board the Ottoman Admiral's ship, and began to lay aside her apparel, preparatory to retiring to rest. She was already wearied of the monotonous life of shipboard, and the strange revelations which the disclosure between Ibrahim Pasha and Demetrius had developed to her ears, rendering her doubly anxious to set foot upon her native soil. The Grand Vizier had paid his respects to her every day since she first embarked on board the Turkish ship, and they exchanged a few observations, rather of courtesy than in any deeper interest, by means of the tablets. Ibrahim's manner toward her was respectful, but when he imagined himself to be unperceived by her, his eyes were suddenly lighted up with the fires of ardent passion, and he devoured her with his burning glances she failed not to notice the effect which her glorious beauty produced upon him and she studiously avoided the imprudence of giving him the least encouragement not from any innate feeling of virtue but because she detested him as a man who was bent on accomplishing a marriage between her brother and flora francatelli this hatred she concealed and even the eagle-sighted ibrahim perceived not that he was in any way displeasing to the lovely nisida with the exception of the grand vizier and the slaves who waited upon her the lady saw no one on board the ship, for she never quitted the saloon allotted to her, but passed her time chiefly in surveying the broad sea and the other vessels of the fleet from the windows, or in meditating upon the course which she should pursue on her arrival in Florence. But let us return to the thread of our narrative. The last tints of the sunset were, we said, fading away, when the lady Nisida commenced her preparations for retiring to rest. She closed the casements, satisfied herself that the partition door between the two saloons was well secured and then threw herself upon the voluptuous couch spread in one of the smaller cabins opening from her own magnificent apartment she thought of ferdinand her handsome ferdinand whom she had abandoned on the isle of snakes and profound sighs escaped her then she thought of francisco and the idea of serving that much beloved brother's interests afforded her a consolation for having thus quitted the clime where she had passed so many happy days with wagner at length sleep fell upon her and closed over the large dark brilliant eyes the white lids beneath the transparent skin of which the blue veins were so delicately traced and the long jetty lashes reposed on the cheeks which the heat of the atmosphere tinged with a rich carnation glow and when the moon arose that night its silver rays streamed through the window set in the porthole of that small cabin upon the beauteous face of the sleeper but hark there is the light sound of a footfall in the saloon from which that cabin opens the treacherous ibrahim possesses a key to the partition door and having successfully wrestled with his raging desires until this moment he is at length no longer able to resist the temptation of invading the sanctity of nisida's sleeping place already has he set his foot upon the very threshold of the little side cabin having traversed the spacious saloon when a hand is laid upon his shoulder and a voice behind him says in a low tone your highness has forgotten the fate of the murdered calanthe ibrahim started shook the hand from off him and exclaimed dog of a negro what and who has made thee a spy upon my actions at the same instant that ibrahim felt the hand on his shoulder and heard the well-known voice uttering the dreadful warning in his ears nisida awoke her first impulse was to start up but checking herself with wondrous presence of mind 
as the part of the deaf and dumb person which she had imposed upon herself to play flashed with lightning velocity across her brain comprehending too in an instant that the grand vizier had violated her privacy but that some unknown succour was at hand she remained perfectly motionless as if still wrapped up in an undisturbed slumber the grand vizier and the individual whom he had in his rage addressed as a dog of the negro retreated into the saloon nisida holding her very breath so as not to lose a word that might pass between them should their dialogue be resumed your highness asks me what and who has made me a spy upon your actions said the negro in a low monotonous voice and speaking with mingled firmness and respect those questions are easily answered the same authority which ordered me to wrest from thine arm some months past the lady who might be unfortunate enough to please your highness's fancy exercises an unceasing supervision over you even on this ship and in the middle of the mighty sea to that authority all your deeds and acts are matters of indifference save those which would render your highness faithless to an adoring wife remember my lord the fate of calanthe the sister of your dependent demetrius she who was torn from your arms and whose beauteous form became food for the fishes of the bosporus how knew you who she was demanded the grand vizier in a low hoarse voice the power of his utterance having been temporarily suspended by the rage that filled his soul at finding his iniquitous design in respect to nisida thus suddenly baffled by the chief of the three black slaves whose attendance in this expedition had been forced upon him by the sultana belida how knew you who she was he asked again rather demand my lord what can escape the prying eyes of those by whom your highness has been surrounded ever since the seals of office were in your grasp returned the slave but you could not betray that secret to demetrius who is now devoted to me who is necessary to me and who would loathe me were he to learn the dreadful fate of his sister said the grand vizier with rapid and excited utterance i have no eyes and no ears great pasha said the negro save in respect to those matters which would render you faithless to the sister of the sultan would to heaven that you had neither eyes nor ears at all that you did not exist indeed exclaimed ibrahim unable to repress his wrath then in a different and milder tone he immediately replied slave i can make thee free i can give thee wealth and thou mayest dwell in happy italy whither we are going for the remainder of thy days reflect consider i love that deaf and dumb christian woman who sleepeth there i already love her to distraction thwart me not good slave and thou mayest command my eternal gratitude my lord two other slaves overhear every word that now passes between us responded the ethiopian his voice remaining calm and monotonous and even were we alone in all respects i would not betray the trust reposed in me but not on your highness would the effects of your infidelity to the princess aistra fall no my lord i have no authority to harm you had your highness succeeded in your purpose ere now the bowstring would have forever still the breath in the body of that deaf and dumb christian lady and her corpse would have been thrown forth from these windows into the sea such are my instructions my lord and thus every object of your sated passion must become your victim also better better were it exclaimed ibrahim in a tone denoting the profoundest mental anguish to be the veriest mendicant who implores arms at the gate of the mosque of st sophia than the grand vizier of the ottoman empire with these words he rushed into the adjoining saloon the negro following and fastening the door behind him nisa now began to breathe freely once more from what perils had she escaped the violation of her couch by the unprincipled ibrahim would have been followed by her immediate assassination at the hands of the ethiopian whom the sultana mother had placed as a spy on the actions of her son-in-law on the other hand she felt rejoiced that the incident of this night had occurred for it had been the means of revealing to her a secret of immense importance in connection with the grand vizier she remembered the terms of grief and affection in which demetrius had spoken of the disappearance of calanthe and she had heard enough on that occasion to convince her that the greek would become the implacable enemy of any man who had wronged the much-loved sister how bitter then would be the hatred of demetrius how dreadful would be the vengeance which he must crave against him whose lustful passion had led to the murder of calanthe yes ibrahim my secret is now in the possession of nisida of riverola in the possession of that woman of iron mind and potent energy with whom thou fondly believest to be deaf and dumb nisida slept no more that night the occurrences of which furnished her with so much food for profound meditation 
and with the earliest gleam of dawn that tinged the eastern heaven she rose from her couch entering the saloon she opened the windows to admit the gentle breeze of morning and ere she commenced her toilet she lingered to gaze upon the stately ships that were ploughing the blue sea in the wake of the admiral's vessel wherein she was suddenly her eyes fell upon what appeared to be a small speck at a little distance but as this object was moving rapidly along the surface of the mediterranean it soon approached sufficiently near to enable her to discern that it was a boat impelled by a single sail urged by an undefinable and yet a strong sentiment of curiosity nisa remained at the saloon window watching the progress of the little bark which bounded over the waves with extraordinary speed bending gracefully to the breeze that thus wafted it onward nearer and nearer toward the vessel it came though not pursuing the same direction and in five minutes it passed within a few yards of the stern of the capitan pasha's ship but oh wondrous and unaccountable fact there stretched upon his back in that bounding boat and evidently buried in deep slumber with the rays of the rising sun gleaming upon his fine and now slightly flushed countenance lay he whose image was so indelibly impressed upon the heart of nisida her handsome and strangely fated ferdinand wagner the moment the conviction that the sleeper was indeed he struck to the mind of nisida she would have called him by name she would have endeavoured to awake him if only to exchange a single word of fondness for her assumed dumbness was for the moment forgotten but she was rendered motionless and remained speechless stupefied paralysed as it were with mingled wonder and joy wonder that he should have found the means of escape from the island and joy that she was thus permitted to behold him at least once again but the pleasure which this incident excited in her mind was transitory indeed for the boat swept by as if urged on by a stronger impulse than that of the gentle breeze of morning and in another minute nisida beheld it no more the sun was setting behind the western hills of sicily as ferdinand wagner entered the squalid suburb which at that period stretched from the town of syracuse to the sea his step was elastic and he held his head high for his heart was full of joyous and burning hope hitherto the promises of the angel who had last appeared to him were completely fulfilled the boat was wafted by a favourable breeze direct from the island of snakes to the shores of sicily and he had landed in the immediate vicinity of syracuse the town in which a further revelation was to be made in respect to the breaking of the spell which had fixed upon him the frightful doom of the werewolf but little suspected ferdinand wagner that one morning while he slept his boat had borne him through the proud fleet of the ottomans little wist he that his beloved nisida had caught sight of him as he was wafted rapidly to pass the stern of the capitan pasha's ship for on that occasion he had slept during hours and when he had awakened not a bark nor sail save his own was visible on the mighty expanse of water and now it was with elastic step and joyous heart that the hero of our tale entered the town of syracuse but suddenly he remembered the signature nature of the inquiry that he was there to make an inquiry concerning a man whose years had numbered one hundred and sixty-two nevertheless thought wagner that good angel who gave me a sign whereby i should become convinced of the reality of her appearance and whose promises have all been fulfilled up to this point could not possibly mislead me no i will obey the command which i received even though i should visit every human dwelling in the town of syracuse for heaven works out its wise purposes in wondrous manners and it is not for me to shrink from yielding obedience to its orders nor to pause to question their propriety and oh if i can but shake off that demon influence which weighs upon my soul if i can but escape from the shackles which still enchain me to a horrible doom how sincere will be my thanks to heaven how unbounded my rejoicing as wagner had reached this point in his meditations he stopped at the door of a barber shop of mean appearance the pole with the basin hanging to it denoting that the occupant of the place combined as was usual in those times the functions of shaver and bloodletter or surgeon hastily surveying the exterior of the shop and fancying that it was precisely the one at which his inquiry should commence barbers in that age being as famous for their gossiping propensities as in this ferdinand entered and was immediately accosted by a short sharp-visaged dark-complexioned old man who pointed to a seat saying in a courteous or rather obsequious tone what is your will signor fernand desired the barber surgeon to shave his superfluous beard and trim his hair and while that individual was preparing his lather and sharpening his razor in the most approved style of the craft wagner asked in a seemingly careless tone what news have you good master in syracuse 
not of importance signor was the reply mere everyday matters syracuse is indeed wretchedly dull there were only two murders and three attempts at assassination reported to the lieutenant of police this morning and that is nothing for a town usually so active and bustling as ours for my part i don't know what has come over the people i stepped as far as the dead house just now to view the body of a young lady unclaimed as yet who had her head nearly severed from her trunk last night and then i proceeded to the great square to see whether any executions are to take place to-morrow but really there is nothing of any consequence to induce one to stir abroad in syracuse just at this moment murders and attempts at assassination are matters of very common occurrence amongst you then said wagner inquiringly we get a perfect surfeit of them signor returned the barber now applying the soap to his customer's face they fail to create any sensation now i can assure you beside one gets tired of executions naturally enough said ferdinand but i have heard that there are some very extraordinary personages in syracuse indeed that there is one who has lived to a remarkable age the oldest person i know of is the abbot of st mary's interrupted the barber and he and he repeated ferdinand with feverish impatience is ninety-seven and three months signor a great age truly responded the barber surgeon ferdinand's hopes were immediately cooled down but thinking that he ought to put his inquiry in a direct manner he said then it is not true that you have in syracuse an individual who has reached the wondrous age of a century three score and two holy virgin have mercy upon you signor ejaculated the barber if you really put faith in the absurd stories that people tell about the rosicrucians ah then the people of syracuse do talk on such matters said ferdinand conceiving that he had obtained a clue to the aim and object of his inquiry have you never heard signor of the order of the rosy cross demanded the barber who was naturally of a garrulous disposition and who now appeared to have entered on a favourite subject i have heard in my travels vague mentions made of such an order answered ferdinand but i have never experienced any curiosity to seek to learn more and indeed i may say that i know nothing of the rosicrucians save their mere name well signor continued the barber for common past talk it is as good a subject as any other but no one shall ever persuade me either that there really is such an order as the brothers of the rosy cross or that it is possible for human beings to attain the powers attributed to that fraternity you interest me much by your remarks good leech exclaimed ferdinand i pray you to give me further explanation with infinite pleasure signor since you appear to desire it returned the barber still pursuing his tonsorial duties you must know that there are many wild legends and stories abroad concerning these invisible beings denominated rosy christians but the one which gains most general credence is that the brotherhood was founded by a certain christianus rosencrux a german philosopher who fancied that the arts and sciences might be developed in such a manner as to convey the greatest possible blessings on the human race then the aims of rosencrux are indeed good and philanthropic said ferdinand interrogatively as a matter of course signor said the barber and therefore if such a man ever did live he must have been an insane visionary for who would believe that knowledge could possibly make us richer happier or better all the philosophy in the universe could never convert this shop into a palace but you are wandering from your subject my good friend gently remonstrated ferdinand i crave your pardon signor let me see oh i recollect we were talking of christianus rosencrux well signor the fabled philosopher was a monk and a very wise as well as a very good man i am only telling you the most generally received legend mind and would not have you think that i believe it myself so this rosencrux finding that his cloistral existence was inconvenient for the prosecution of his studies travelled into the east and spent many years acquiring the knowledge handed down to the wise men of those climes by the ancient magi and chaldeans he visited egypt and learned many wonderful secrets by studying the hieroglyphics on the egyptian pyramids i forget how long he remained in the east but it is said that he visited every place of interest in the holy land and received heavenly inspirations on the spot where our saviour was crucified 
on his return to europe he saw full well that if he revealed all his knowledge at once he would be put to death by the inquisition as a wizard and the world would lose the benefit of all the learning he had acquired so says the legend and it goes on to recite that christianus rosencrux then founded the order of the rosy cross which was nothing more or less than a brotherhood of wise men whom he initiated in all his secrets with the intention that they should reveal from time to time small portions thereof and thus give to the world by very slow degrees that immense amount of knowledge which he supposed would have stupefied and astounded everybody if made public all at once strange most strange thought wagner within himself but i should never have gleamed all these details before eager as my inquiries and researches in the pursuit of knowledge have been but heaven has willed everything for the best and it is doubtless indeed that my salvation shall proceed from the very quarter which was least known to me and concerning which i have manifested the most contemptuous indifference in the sphere of knowledge you appear to be much interested signor said the barber in this same tale of christianus rosencrux but there is too much intelligence depicted on your countenance to allow me to suppose that you will place any reliance on the absurd story how is it possible signor that an order could have existed for so many years without any one member ever having betrayed the secrets which bind them all together moreover their place of abode and study is totally unknown to the world and if they inhabited the deepest caverns under the earth accident must sooner or later have led to its discovery believe me signor tis not save a ridiculous legend though a poor ignorant man myself i hope i have too much good sense and too much respect for my father confessor to suppose for a minute that there is on earth any set of men more learned than the holy ministers of the church how long ago is christianus rosencrux reported to have lived demanded wagner suddenly interrupting the garrulous and narrow-minded sicilian there we are again he ejaculated the credulous declare that rosencrux discovered in the east the means of prolonging existence and though he was born as far back as the year thirteen fifty nine he is still alive had not the barber turned aside at that precise instant to fill a an ewer and place a towel for his customer's use he would have been surprised by the sudden start and the expression of ineffable joy which denoted ferdinand's emotions as by a rapid calculation mentally made our hero perceived that if rosencrux was born in thirteen fifty nine and alive at that moment namely in fifteen twenty one his age would be exactly one hundred and sixty two it is christianus rosencrux then he said to himself whom i have inquired for whom i am to see and who will dissolve the spell that has been placed upon me but where shall i seek him whither shall i go to find his secret abode the duties of the barber were completed and wagner threw down a piece of gold saying keep that coin friend for your discourse has greatly interested me and indeed well deserved it the poor old man had never possessed in all his life so much money at one time and so vast was his joy that he could only mutter a few broken sentences to express his gratitude i require not thanks my good friend said wagner but one word ere i depart knowest thou the spot which rumour indicates as the abode of that sect of whom we have been speaking nay excellent signor replied the barber there your question masters me for in this case rumour goes not to such a length as to afford hints for an investigation which would prove its ultra fallacy all that i have heard signor concerning the rosicrucians you have learnt from my lips and i know no more wagner finding that further inquiry in that quarter was useless took leave of the old man and traversing the suburb entered the town of syracuse End of section sixty two